Well, welcome, and it's great to be here. Um, we want to give you a feel today for um, what it's like to work with uh, the energies of the Earth. And uh, we have chosen the St. Michael Ley Line uh, for various reasons. <clears throat> One is that my birthday is uh, Michaelmas Day, St. Michael's Feast Day, and so I've been associated or felt a draw to Michael my whole life. And I've also spent mm, close on the last 20 years um, following um, the Michael energies, visiting these sites, and working with the energies. Um, but, you know, this is one little aspect. Um, as Hugh said, it goes all, all the way around the world, and we'll be looking at that. But before um, we, we, we get into that, I want to actually um, do a couple of definitions. I want to define what a ley line is and define what Earth energy currents are, because there's a lot of misunderstanding. Um, a ley line, which was coined by Alfred Watkins about 100 years ago, um, w was simply a straight line. He, s he, he saw from a hilltop uh, objects in a straight line, and he thought they had significance. He didn't talk about energies at all. A ley line is simply a line on the ground that you can draw on a map that is a straight line that connects four or more significant sites. Any two points can be joined by a straight line. Three, it could be coincidence. Four, it's starting to look interesting. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, um, and in this case, um, <laughs> dozens and dozens, uh, it means that something is really happening. So the actual ley line itself is not does not necessarily have energy. Um, but, uh, and, and, and this St. Michael line was rediscovered in modern times by uh, John Michel, to whom we all owe a tremendous debt for his insightful, um, well, his insight, his insight um, into this subject of megalithomania and Earth mysteries. And John Michel was standing on top of Glastonbury Tor, um, and he saw this again in his mind's eye and looked at the maps and, 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 and re brought it back into our consciousness. Of course, it was known about a um, long, long, long time ago. Uh, and so th th this, um, I think, is a pointer here. Do we have a, a pointer? Um, does anyone have a, a, a laser pointer? Could you use? <coughs> Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> so this straight line is the Michael Ley line. This is the tip of Cornwall, just to locate you. Here's London. Uh, and this is called East Anglia. Uh, and so that is the alignment. And this isn't any old random line. If you uh, stand at a tip of Cornwall on the morning of Beltane, which is, we now call it May Day in um, pagan times, um, in, in Celtic philosophy, it was called Beltane. And if on the morning of Beltane you watch the sun rise, it would be right here, exactly along this line. It's the Beltane sunrise alignment. <clears throat> well, in the late 80s, um, Hamish Miller, who we've heard about and to whom we also have a tremendous debt, decided to, to, that he would douse the energy of this ley line, starting down here in Cornwall where he lived, and um, to see if there was energy associated with it, because everyone assumed there was, and he thought he would find energy running straight along. And when he, he got about half a mile and decided either he was a really poor dowser or something interesting was happening because it wasn't following the straight line. It was curving away to the south. And what they discovered was that the Michael energy current, as they dubbed it, basically does this. It weaves around the straight line of the ley line. They got halfway to Avebury and discovered a second powerful energy current that they couldn't ignore anymore, went back to the beginning, started again, and this time, because the frequency was very different, they dubbed this energy current the Mary current. 
And when Michael goes south of the line, Mary goes north. So Mary does that. Now, as you can imagine, they will cross at certain points. There are 22 crossing points or node points along the 350 mile length of this ley line. Um, only 10 of them actually sit on the straight line itself. 12 of them are slightly off to one side. Um, Earth, what are Earth energy currents? Um, and, and this is a uh, representation. We all know uh, the caduceus um, from uh, Hippocrates and, and the symbol of the medical profession. Uh, so, you know, it, it's wonderful. Here we've got the straight line of the ley line, and here we've got the twin serpent currents of the energy currents. And this is what's happening in the natural world. And this isn't the only ley line that this um, happens on. So, what are energy currents? Here we have our beautiful planet, which is spinning at 1,100 miles an hour. And the latest scientific um, belief or view is that the center of the Earth is a huge iron crystal, 1,500 miles across. Such a huge crystalline iron mass around, and that's right in the, in the center here. If I can find this thing. Uh, here. Then around that is a molten magma, and then on the surface, 70 miles thick is the Earth's crust. So I would say the Earth is a little bit like a squidgy peach, and as it spins at 1,100 miles an hour, electromagnetism is generated. Uh, it wants to come to the surface by the path of least resistance, and in the case of the Earth, that's one of three things underground water, underground beds of conductive uh, mineral, particularly quartz crystal, or geological fault lines in the earth. <coughs> um, this is a sort of a, a, a schematic representation of what I think is actually happening within the earth. Um, so it, and I'd like to make this analogy with the electronic components because I think our ancestors were doing electronics on the landscape level, as um, Glenn in his last talk mentioned about Avebury. Uh, I, 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 I totally agree with that. I think that's what they were doing. So here we've got, if you like, uh, we, we would see it as a silicon chip, but let's say this is the huge crystalline iron mass in the center. And then uh, down here, these uh, could be the uh, underground reservoirs of water, and he, these are the underground streams. Uh, these big chips here, let's say these are like resistors, uh, big banks, say, of mica, um, and we've got other chips in here that are quartz. So this whole thing, the Earth is like a huge circuit board, and it's generating this electricity, or no, sorry, electromagnetism, which wants to go to the surface. So it zooms up. So let's take this point here, you know, up there. Up at that point there, what if you built this? Then it's drawing up these powerful energies that have been generated in the center of the Earth. And because this is a tower as well, this is uh, Glendalock in Ireland, the round tower, this is reaching up into the heavens and drawing down cosmic energy as well. So here you've got this fabulous sacred site that's combining heaven and Earth. Okay. So now this isn't just a dead old map. Each of these places it's very much like I've shown you here. We, on our journey, we spent six weeks traveling the line and we visited 99 sacred sites, photographed them all and spent time with them. Uh, it's actually, from the first time I went down to the south of Cornwall, it took me seven years before I reached the far end, um, which I l later realized, of course, was a time of apprenticeship, so it's perfect, actually. And this is how it ties in with what we saw last night, the Rainbow Serpent Path. Um, here we are, this is England, and there, just that little section across England is the St. Michael line. But actually, what this is a, a major energy path that runs all the way across the, the planet through Lake Titicaca, where Hugh has doused 
the Michael currents through Britain, through Leningrad up here, Moscow, and then down through Mount Kailash and down through Uluru in Australia and back again, circling the Earth. And this isn't the only uh, energy line that, that does that. Uh, for example, here on St. Michael's Mount, just off the tip of Cornwall, uh, at this point here, there's a, there's a rocking stone, and that, that, uh, the Michael and Mary energy currents both converge there, but also the Apollo and Athena lines do. And they're currents of another line that goes across Europe. But today, we're concentrating on um, the, the, the St. Michael line. And in China, energy currents uh, were often referred to as dragon paths. And you know, so, in so many places along the line in England, you see dragon representation. The energy current ran through this building, which has this dragon um, uh, on, the t on the top of the building. Uh, and here in a church at Kirtling in Suffolk, on the tomb of the second Baron of Kirtling, um, who died, it says, at the age of 70 in um, uh, 1600, uh, here is um, a dragon. It's, it's, it's described um, in, in some of the history books as, as, as a rampant lion. I've never seen a lion with wings. And look at this, there's a chain. So, you know, they, that family used it to say, we have harnessed the greatest power in the world, the power of dragon energy. Uh, well, what we find when we go along the line, and this is Brentor um, on Dartmoor, fabulous place. There are still services here every Sunday, and this is the path up. So the congregation actually uh, have to walk up. The, well, it, they don't scale it on ropes, uh, but the, there's no path up as such. But um, fabulous place. And Michael, the Michael Energy current goes through high places, uh, hilltops, places associated with air and fire. And this is a picture of St. Michael, the stained glass window within Brentor Church on the top there. That's the stained glass window behind the altar in there. And Mary goes through low-lying places. This is Glastonbury Abbey. Glastonbury is very low-lying in the Somerset levels. Uh, and there's a watery place that it goes through um, Chalice, Chalice Well. So that's really just um, a, 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 an introduction to, for you of, of what we're talking about, the difference between ley lines and earth energies. And uh, um, now we're going to, uh, because this is Michael and Mary, we do this sort of tag team thing, male, female, of swapping backwards and forwards to get you in the swing of it. <laughs> this is actually another little, uh, this is Alyssa Holywell, which is on the um, Mary line, uh, which was Glenn's last slide, but anyway, that's why that's there. And uh, Holy Wells were revered for thousands of years. It's actually, this is what we would consider a sacred spring, and uh, pagans uh, uh, would have come here with their prayers and asked for guidance, and uh, that's really goes into um, another part of what I'm talking about, which I'll talk about later. So now we're going to talk about energy. And uh, so we're talking today about earth energies and what do they mean to us? How can we relate to them? Well, this is Boscanoon Stone Circle, and the Mary Current runs through this stone circle down in Cornwall. And if you look at this megalithic stone right here, uh, it's almost like uh, an acupuncture needle. It also, like uh, the Glendalock Tower, is drawing up the earth energies from below and drawing down the celestial energies from above. Um, 
And what's really interesting is that this stone looks like it might have fallen over, but we don't think that it has fallen over. We think that it was actually placed that way because it actually points in the same direction that the Mary current, where the Mary current makes a turn at that very point. And it's also uh, probably pointed to the Pleiades. So there was a reason for why they did that. And most stone circles are made out of uh, stone that holds a huge amount of uh, crystal content in it. And I know that you all know that crystals hold, um, hold memories. And um, we use crystal quartz in our computers, our wristwatches. The first radios had a crystal, and that's how it tuned in. It was able to uh, be receptive to the energies. And um, so in stone circles, they still hold that memory of why it is that these stone circles were built, I believe. And we're drawn to go there so that we can connect with what it is that our ancestors had to teach us or what it is that the purpose for why they built the stone circles. The circles themselves, they hold, they're a cauldron, they hold the energy from within the circle and uh, they most likely used it to empower uh, their ceremonies. This is uh, our dear friend Hamish Miller who passed away a year and a half ago. And uh, another way that you pick up energies is also by dowsing. And he was a master dowser. And um, he believed that you could actually communicate with the earth energies. And he had a um, an energy vortex in his home that he doused, and he communicated with it regularly. And when he would communicate with it, he would then douse the vortex, and it would have changed shape. Instead of maybe six radials of energy that was coming out of the vortex, it might have changed to a uh, 12 radius, radials of energy that was coming out of it. And uh, he believed that you could communicate with the energy. So part of it is, uh, is how we relate to it. When we go to a site, if we are there with the intention of um, connecting to, to what it is that's there, and using it, then we can be empowered ourselves to have a more magical experience than, say, if you just went and you looked at it as a regular tourist. This is another way to connect, just by hugging it. And this is what I call really being laid back. This is a good friend of ours, Aunt Hughes, Larry Bolin, and a few years ago he came with us on one of our uh, pilgrimages, and he just loved this granite rock there, and as you can see, he's basking in the sunlight, he's soaking up the energy from this beautiful stone, and connecting with, uh, with the energy that's there. And it's also bringing you back into balance when you're at these places. Um, the earth energies, the heartbeat of uh, the earth was, is, was nine hertz. And we are told by Greg Braden that it has now moved to 12 or 13 hertz. And what's significant about that is that when we meditate, that is the same hertz that we, we resonate at as well. So when you're here, you actually get to that point of being in alignment with the energy that's there and um, <coughs> being in alignment with the earth. 
And when you're in that place, you think more clearly, you can be creative, it can give uh, energy to your dreams, your thoughts. You can just be more connected to source and to nature. Uh, this is Zakaya Blackburn, who has traveled with us in England. Um, he's a master sound healer. He resonates with earth energies and, uh, and does his work specifically from his connection with the land for where it is that he travels to. This is a crop circle. And crop circles also hold energies, whether they're earth energies or cosmic energies, I'm not quite sure, or a little bit of both. But anyway, many times when we go into crop circles, uh, everybody just wants to flop down and bring themselves into balance with the energy that's present. Here we're at Chalice Well Gardens, and the Mary Current runs um, through the water that runs all the way through the garden. And uh, it's well known, it's in Glastonbury. And here, people have taken off their shoes, they're standing in the water, and they are also picking up the vibration of the Mary Energy Current. So, you're in these magical places, and you can use the magic, you can use the energy to support whatever your ceremony might be. Here they're dancing on top of Glastonbury Tor. And here are some friends of ours who decided to get married in Avebury on Beltane. And they're using the magic of the energy that's present there to give power to their commitment and love for one another. So magic. Magic can happen at places, and I want to tell you a story about uh, a magical event that happened to me here. This is the tip of Cornwall where Michael and Mary first come in. This rocky outcrop is called Carn Le Bowl. Um, there's a lot of connection between the tip of Cornwall, well, Cornwall and Brittany in France, and so you get a lot of names that are very similar to French. There's a lot of connections. So this is Carn Le Bowl. Uh, the Michael and Mary currents come in um, through this rocky outcrop and there's no point up on the headland up there. Um, it, it, as Cameron mentioned, m the rock down there is heavily crystalline studded granite. Um, it, the, the crystal content is uh, way up in the 90%. So it, it, you're, you're on this potentized uh, ground. Uh, Cornwall actually has more sacred sites per square mile than anywhere else on the planet. And it also is stunningly beautiful. This is Nanjizel Bay, so the headland where Michael and Mary cross is just here to our left, and this is the bay to the right. <coughs> and um, I, it, when I first heard about these um, NG currents, which was in 1992, um, uh, s someone gave me a copy of uh, Hamish Mill and Paul Broadhurst's book, which is this, The Sun and the Serpent. And if you're interested to know about um, Earth energies, and in particular about the St. Michael Ley Line and the Michael and Mary NG currents, this is uh, the Bible. You can get on Amazon very easily. <laughs> Uh, so someone gave me a copy of that and I read it and I thought, wow, this, this information could change the world, but, uh, you know, maybe it's not true. Maybe these guys are nutcases, maybe they're misguided. Um, I need to check this out for myself. And so I started dowsing one or two places and then, of course, I wanted to go to a place where the energy currents first came in. And I, so I went down to Nanjiz Bay and I felt I'd been drawn for several months to get there. Um, I, I went there on, a, on February morning. Um, this, this is winter. These people weren't with me. I was actually on my own, um, although. Um, <clears throat> and, and I went out to the tip of um, Conley Bowl. I couldn't feel a thing. 
Um, I was absolutely gutted. You know, I, I felt so drawn to be there, so drawn to these energy currents. I'd been down and miles away, couldn't find them. And one thing, as you will know, I'm sure there are a lot of dowsers in the audience, if you don't get a result, you don't get a result. You can't make these things up. Well, you can, but if you do, you're fooling yourself. So I was just forlorn and sort of, uh, in the end, gave up, walked across the beach, um, and my head was hanging down. Um, and, and, and you can see, um, looking back, this is in summer, and uh, you, you've got all this beautiful sand, but in winter, the strong Atlantic rollers come in and they drag all the sand out and they um, expose the rocks uh, beneath. And all these rocks are really smooth, round boulders because they've been tumbled by the waves for eons. And then my eye was caught by one particular rock, which I'm afraid I don't have a photograph of it. I didn't have a camera with me. And this rock caught my eye because it was jagged. It wasn't smooth like the rest. And I bent down, picked it up, and I, I, as we say in England, I was gobsmacked. Um, <laughs> uh, I was sort of awestruck because it was like the size of a loaf of bread. And it was solid quartz, and it was in the shape of a ram's head a male sheep, a ram. And I say that because um, it, it, it had two curling horns that were made out of large crystal points that tapered and got smaller to the tip. And the eyes were two sunken little caves of crystalline points. And the nose, down the nose, was a bloody streak. It was um, obviously some red ore within the... Um, the quartz rock. And uh, this was the most amazing thing uh, I'd ever seen. And I just qualified as a crystal healer. So I said, yay, thank you. This is why I had to come here. This is obviously for my healing room. Thank you very much. Turned around to leave the beach and got this blinding pain across my sinuses. Uh, I literally stopped me in my tracks. And I turned around, faced the ocean, no pain. Uh, took another breath, turned around, same thing. And this happened three times. So then I said, OK, I'm obviously not to take you away from this beach today. What am I to do? I sat down, placed the ram's head crystal on my lap, and opened myself to meditation. And you know, I'm a fairly ordinary guy. I don't hear voices. I don't have psychic visions. I don't see auras. But occasionally, on Special occasions like this, um, our senses are heightened. And I heard very clearly that day, take me to the cave on the beach. I didn't even know there was a cave on the beach. I didn't see a cave. Um, when I looked, uh, actually, there's a cave around here. Um, here it is. From, from the sea level, it's very obvious. When you're up here, it isn't obvious. So I took a um, ram's head crystal to the cave, went inside. I couldn't see very much because uh, I got used to the dark, and I was feeling around. All the walls were really smooth and wet, um, smooth of granite rock. Uh, I sort of felt my way around. And then as my eyes got used to it, it, it goes back about maybe 20 feet. It's probably 20 feet high. It's really a cleft in the rock. And then I saw on the right-hand side a low shelf. I went over to the shelf, and the shelf was all crystal points. It was the only thing in the cave that wasn't smooth granite. It was a bed, a shelf of crystal points, and at the back was a cavity, a piece missing. And I offered the crystal rem's head into it, and it fitted in like, um, like a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. Um, I, I still get emotional thinking about this because um, it's at times like this when you realize there's something much greater than me happening here. I'm being communicated with some, by some powers that I'm not aware of, um, but the, the, I, I was guided to come and do this. And 
um, I, I sat on the, the on the shelf and did a meditation. And what I realised, uh, well, the question came. Um, the the, the guide really said to me, "You have a choice. Um, you can say what a great experience. Go away and get on with the rest of your life, or." you can make a commitment at this point to follow and to be of service to spirit and the earth energies and the spiritual guides of the earth um, uh, wherever you can. And immediately the question came into my mind, the answer was already there in my body, a whole body uh, commitment of yes, I do this. Um, and so this is probably um, the most powerful day of my life, um, certainly uh, a major day of commitment for me, and one which I followed. Um, as I say, it then took me seven years to get to the other end uh, of the line, and that was a time of learning when the earth spoke with me and taught me um, all sorts of things that, um, uh, which, which had been my training, my spiritual training, if you like. Uh, so I just want to show you this slide because it sort of really reflects what I made on that day. And also, uh, it, 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 once one commits, it, it says, concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there's one elementary truth, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents, meetings, and material assistance which no man could have dreamt would have come, would have come his way. And I know that's very much what Tor has been experiencing on his work with the rainbow, rainbow serpent, and is open to us all in every moment of our lives. Thank you, Glenn. I met Glenn in 1996 on the first tour that he ever led. And it was a great changing time for me anyway. And I was open tra to transition. And I was really gobsmacked, so to say, <laughs> by Glenn. And I still love hearing him share his stories. And it's true that these experiences are there for all of us. It's not just, uh, we can each have magical experiences, and all we have to do is to commit, commit to the path. So here we are back at this sacred spring down in Cornwall, and what I'm going to talk about now is the importance of water. And We've been learning more and more, uh, or remembering more and more, what it is about water that's, that's important. But water has been revered for eons. And it was revered by the pagans and Celtic people and people from traditions all over the world. But I'm going to stick to um, the pagan and uh, Christian religions because that's what's in England and along this path. So when uh, paganism or earth-based uh, spirituality was sort of taken over or hijacked by <laughs> Christianity, uh, they also still revered <coughs> the water and they made holy wells and they built um, these beautiful uh, structures over the water, and they used it in their baptisms. They knew that water was important to really to potentize um, bringing their children into the world and into Christianity. And still today, people are still making their pilgrimages to Chaliswell Garden, where they drink the red spring water here 
And water also is, uh, in Celtic traditions, um, it is represented in the spirit of the West, which is also uh, connected with our emotions. This is actually a picture of Bickley Bridge, and it's in Devon. And this is the bridge that's the bridge over troubled waters in Paul Simon's song. So he knew that the troubled waters, it wasn't that the water uh, was necessarily troubled, but that that's what he associated with troubled waters, water that's rising. And here we have water that's crashing down in a waterfall at Lidford Gorge, which is also on the line. And this, uh, this is also where negative ions occur. When water is hitting, hitting hard or crashing, it uh, creates negative ions. And negative ions actually make us feel better. So if you ever want to feel better, if you're at a low point, go somewhere where you know there's a waterfall and just be with it and stand there. Water is also um, in, has three different elements. It's, it's in ice structure, it's in vapor in the clouds, and it's also in liquid state. And it's actually when it's in its liquid state that it's the most dense. And there isn't anything else like that. Water also occurs under crop circles. That's at Eastfield. And as we, many of us here know about Dr. Emoto's work, and this is the crystal of love and thanks. So Dr. Emoto, what he did was that he placed the word love and thanks on the bottle of water. And then he froze, um, froze the water. And these crystals are what formed with love and thanks. Here we have a crop circle that looks very similar to that image. This is a crystal of war. And as you see, it can't hold its structure. And I'm going to finish with love and thanks because I don't want to finish with war. <laughs> From uh, Glastonbury, Connecticut to Glastonbury, England, um, I, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the, 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 there are 22 node points on the St. Michael uh, ley line, and 10 of them are on the straight line itself um, that those are and, and we've we've already seen Conley Bowl down in tip of Cornwall St Michael's Mound is the next one and um, where the Polyathena lines cross as well the next one you've seen that next one up the line is the Hurler Stone Circles <coughs> on Bodmin Moor um, and I, I don't have a slide of that the next one is Brentor Church that you saw the slide of and the next major node point, actually on the straight alignment, is Glastonbury. So <clears throat> I'm following on from that. Um, uh, is Avebury, Ogborn St George, Royston Cave, Bury St Edmunds, and then Hopton, where it leaves the country. And you'll be seeing all of those as we move <coughs> on. So Glastonbury is really special, and Glastonbury and Avebury are really special because of these 22 node points, the 22 places where Michael and Mary energy currents cross in the entire 350 mile length of the Michael Ley Line, uh, no place has more than one node except for Glastonbury that has three, and Avebury which has three. So Glastonbury and Avebury um, on this reckoning are really super mega important places. And they are, of course. I want to um, mention just a little bit about it. We don't have time today to go into um, a lot of detail about any of the places. Um, but one thing um, you, you'll know about Glastonbury, uh, I'm sure, is that it has the tour. And here's the tour and we're with St. Michael's Tower on the top. You know, it, along the St. Michael Ley Line, there are so many churches dedicated to Michael that are on the Michael current, and on the Mary current, the churches are dedicated to Mary. 
who did this? I mean, when these churches were dedicated, quite often um, in um, either in the, well, a lot of the churches are along the line of sort of 1500s. Um, some of the early ones, the cathedrals are uh, 11, 1200s. And back in medieval times, and then sort of going through uh, up to say the 1600s, you know, that when these dedications were made, somebody was tuning in to the fact that they were on this alignment. Um, it's really quite remarkable, because the, this consciousness goes through a, a huge swathe of time, um, from the Neolithic through the, um, uh, uh, th through the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, Christian period, the Roman period, the Dark Ages, the medieval period, up into present historical period, and we're getting um, examples of an awareness of this from every <coughs> of those time periods. This isn't just one thing that was laid down at one frozen moment in time. This is something which has been created over a 5,000 year period, which um, to me is sort of mind boggling and shows that there's a, either consciousness behind it um, or that we are tapping into those energies and acting unconsciously um, based on it. Maybe there's other reasons and we could talk about it afterwards. Anyway, so um, this is taken from Weirial Hill and this is the Holy Thorn Tree, which unfortunately um, last December uh, was vandalized and this top was cut off. But isn't necessarily such a terrible thing because um, it's re-sprouted and we were there just recently and new, new sprouts have come out of the cut-off trunk. Uh, what was cut off, cuttings have been taken from that and also it has brought together people in Glastonbury who hadn't spoken for years and uh, t t talking with people we know who live in Glastonbury, it's really brought a healing, the fact that um, the Holy Thorn Tree wa was, was vandalized. Uh, now, uh, I'm showing you this because uh, the story of the Holy Thorn Tree, you've probably heard it is uh, that Joseph of Arimathea, Jesus' uncle, or the uncle of G Mary, mother of Jesus, depending, I'm not sure which is true, um, he arrived on one of his journeys, planted his staff in the ground, and it sprouted and uh, came into the Holy Thorn Tree because this is a, a type of tree that isn't native to England but is native to the Holy Land and flowers twice a year on the two Christian dates of Christmas and Easter. <laughs> well, um, so, and one of the stories, of course, is um, it, it, did Jesus travel here on, uh, with his uncle on one of the journeys? So, uh, William Blake's anthem, and did those feet, Jerusalem, and I won't sing it, <laughs> uh, and, and did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's pastures green? Did Jesus come and stand here in Glastonbury? So Glastonbury is important from a Christian point of view. Um, this is looking back from the tour to Wirral Hill. Here's a holy thorn tree, just a little tree here. And you know, this has often been likened to a sleeping dragon in the landscape. But I want to announce to you today that the dragon is asleep no more. It's breathing fire. <laughs> the dragon is awakening. <coughs> Glastonbury Abbey became the first um, place of Christianity in Britain. Uh, and here in the remains of Glastonbury Abbey, this very unsupposing sort of little place here, um, is, is a significance for uh, Glastonbury because this is supposedly where King Arthur and his queen, it doesn't actually mention her by name, but it says King Arthur and her queen were buried. There were, uh, uh, there's some dispute as to whether that is true because what happened was um, the first Glastonbury Abbey burnt down in, I think it was 1192, um, something like that. and. Um, uh, they needed to build a new, sorry, um, yeah, they needed to build a new abbey and uh, suddenly the monks were digging, uh, they dig in the cemetery and they found the grave of King Arthur and so suddenly it became the greatest pilgrimage center in England, everyone turned up and they, they were bringing money with them and within two years they got enough money to build a new abbey. 
So n no one's quite sure whether it's a historical truth or whether it was one of the greatest scam fundraisers of all time. <laughs> I'll leave you to form your own opinion. They certainly aren't there anymore. Uh, this is what the Abbey used to look like. And this area here is where the first church was originally built by Joseph of Arimathea. It was originally a round wattle and daub or plaster and stick church. Uh, it was one circular round wooden structure with 12 wooden satellites around it. Uh, Jesus and the 12 disciples, but also the great symbolism and sacred geometry of Numbers 12 and 13 is being played out here. <coughs> so, uh, the Glastonbury's... And its association with Stonehenge. Yes, and its association with Stonehenge, thank you, because um, <laughs> The, 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 the ground plan, and this is another great uh, f find of John Michel's, the plan of the New Jerusalem, that the ground plan of the original Wattle and Daub church and those satellites, if you overlay it on Stonehenge, it's exactly to scale. Um, it has the same ground plan as Stonehenge. Um, here we, we see the waters at Chalice Well in Glastonbury, and here's a vesica pool uh, with the vesica biases here, and we won't go into that, but um, <coughs> the sacred geometry helping to potentize even more these healing waters. And here are people um, doing their own ceremony with the potentized waters uh, of, of Glastonbury. Um, and then, of course, Glastonbury Tor, uh, unmistakable, and would have been a beacon of spirituality for eons, uh, and way before this tower was built on top of it. Uh, it. I don't know if you know, and I'm sure a lot of you have been or seen, but the Glastonbury is surrounded by flat land called the Somerset Levels, and the Tor just sticks up out of this. And so it's this real sort of uh, visual magnet. The tour isn't the tower. Yes, uh, uh, Cameron <coughs> wants me to remind you that the tour is not the tower. The tour is the hill, a natural hill uh, with the tower on the top. The tower dedicated to St. Michael. And the energy, uh, the Michael and Mary energy currents come here and they perform the most incredible dance of anywhere um, that I know, and certainly on the St. Michael uh, path, uh, the Michael and Mary Cancers, doused by Hamish Miller, uh, wander around, but when they get the Glastonbury tour, they do this most amazing thing, and this is what they do. I don't know, I'm sorry, it's, it's a little difficult to distinguish between the two, but um, uh, M Michael uh, is the darker line and this is Michael he comes in here and creates this phallic shape uh, I'm sorry I went wrong there yeah. there we are and then he goes off there Mary <coughs> comes in here, and she goes around the outside of him, holding, if you like, holding him, and then creates this chalice around the phallic shape of Michael's energy current, and then goes and kisses him here, and then wanders off into the countryside. Um, absolutely. There's nowhere else I know where the NG currents perform this. And what incredible masculine-feminine symbolism, which uh, I'm now going to pass over to my female uh, counterpart to talk about. <laughs> Isn't this a wonderful image? This is... Uh I'm going to talk about the um, masculine and feminine energies, and I'm not really talking about male and female. I'm t just talking about um, yin yang. the yin and yang. And here we have uh, the man who is associated with the sun and the female who is associated with the moon. So we have the masculine and the sun energy and 
and the, the feminine energy associated with the moon. And they're in total balance. So um, we each have the masculine and feminine energies within us. And our feminine energy is more intuitive. It's uh, really imaginative and creative. And, and our masculine em energy that's within us is the energy that gives us the power to go out and to accomplish what it is that we've been dreaming about and to get, uh, get things done. And we each have uh, the masculine and feminine, feminine within us to, to certain degrees. And acknowledging that allows us to understand how it is that we can work when we're in balance with those energies. So in this crop circle, we have the yin and the yang symbol. And it's uh, just a crop circle or the crop circle makers who are reminding us <coughs> of how important that is. And it's you know, an old, ancient Chinese symbol that, that we sometimes need to be reminded of, of the importance of, of the masculine and feminine. It's also, uh, we are taught it not just in Glastonbury, but also in Avebury. And this is a drawing that William Stukeley um, drew in the 1700s. So this is, this is an avenue that goes into the, stone, the Avebury circle. And this is also likened to a serpent. So this would be the tail and the body. And coming out here, over here, to the sanctuary is the head of the serpent. And in Avebury, we have the solar circle, or excuse me, the lunar circle and the solar circle. And then we have the, the stones that are facing all the way around. There are 99 stones, or were 99 stones, that made up the central circle of uh, Avebury Stone Circle, and um, which is very relevant in um, in our in. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> uh, in an eight-year period, when the uh, sun and moon rise start, say they start here, it takes 99 uh, moon cycles in order, to, um, in order to come back to the exact same place. So somehow they knew that when they built this stone circle. And also which would be the balance of the uh, sun and the moon. They also knew when they built it, they used um, round stones to depict the feminine and phallic stones to depict the masculine <coughs> all the way across these avenues. So one of the other important parts about uh, Avebury is that within a 10-mile radius is where more crop circles happen than anywhere else in the world. This was a crop circle that occurred in 2001, which was just a staggering uh, crop circle that blew the minds of a lot of people. <laughs> um, and this crop circle happened or occurred on a very rainy night. So I'm sure that you can just imagine that uh, it was other than being hoaxed by Doug and Dave. Here's another beautiful crop circle. And I put this crop circle in uh, because crop circles also have something to teach us. And this uh, was likened to a Mobius strip by Michael Glickman. Uh, 
And the importance of the Mobius strip is that if you were to take a circle in the circle, if I can find that little thing, if you're inside of the circle and you don't want to break the circle, you're inside. And if you're outside the circle, you're outside. And with the Mobius strip, if a shift occurs and you were to put a twist in this circle, you would get a Mobius strip. And with the Mobius strip, when you're inside the circle, you then have a pathway to the outside. So what it does is that it connects the inner and the outer and heaven and earth. So crop circles are great. They've taught us a lot of things. They've also taught us about uh, squaring the circle, which is the square represented uh, the earth and the circle represented the heavens and uh, squaring the circle was uh, not, we didn't know how to do it until we started looking at crop circles. And I don't have any image to show you, but it's definitely worth exploring. This circle occurred on 777. There were some people up on the hill above Eastfields where this circle occurred, and uh, there were definitely not people down there hoaxing it. It's um, over a thousand feet long, and it just was a magnificent occurrence. Bringing us back to the geometry of six and the beauty of the flower and nature. More images. So we're very grateful to crop circles and to the Avebury area. It's uh, definitely, the circle makers think that it's important, not just that it has underground water there, but also the earth energies there. Yes, I just want to add to that by um, <coughs> by saying um, this this morning in his talk, Glenn Kreisberg mentioned about Avebury Stone Circle and the stones uh, having been aligned with their natural north-south um, magnetic sides uh, all lined up, <coughs> and he, he likened that to possi possibly like the CERN particle accelerator. Um, I, 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 I totally concur with that, and, uh, and, and again, for the third time, I have to recommend John Burke's book, um, Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty, fantastic, fantastic book, uh, and, and, and John did experiments with seeds, uh, exposing seeds <coughs> at Avebury. Um, how are we doing on time, by the way, guys? <coughs> fantastic. Um, so skipping along um, <coughs> to uh, the only underground uh, crossing of Michael and Mary on the entire land, Royston Cave. Royston Cave is um, it's in Hertfordshire, so it's not a million miles from Luton, of northwest of London. Uh, and this, th th this is a, a remarkable cave. It, 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 it's, uh, it's under the High Street. Uh, <clears throat> it's actually directly beneath the high street in the centre of Royston. Uh, and you can see here, there's lots of carvings <coughs> on the sandstone walls. This is carved out of the natural sandstone underground. Uh, it's not too deep, I think maybe it's of, I don't know, 30, 50 feet, I uh, can't remember. Um, but look, look, look at this detail here of some of the carving. And it's believed that these carvings are <coughs> done by the Knights Templar. Um, I'm sure you all know of the story of the Knights Templar being persecuted in the early 1300s by uh, the King of France and the Pope at the time, uh, who tried to destroy them because they'd become too powerful. 
uh, they, they really were more powerful than any European monarch or the Pope himself. And so on Friday the 13th, um, the, 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 uh, 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 an operation was mounted to try and destroy them all. Uh, but pe the, the entire fleet got away and uh, they moved to places like Portugal, Malta and Scotland where they were given safe haven. And it appears that some must have come uh, down into England uh, uh, and it's believed that this cave, Royston Cave, uh, was um, a place they used for conducting their ceremonies. They were a Christian sect, um, but w with different views to the Roman Catholic Church, which is why they were persecuted. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, in fact, if I go back, um, you can see, oh, it's not very clear, I'm afraid. Uh, but there's a, Jesus is here on the cross, and uh, yeah, you can't, sorry, you can't see very clearly. Uh, St. Catherine is here with her wheel. I'll go to the uh, closer up version. Here's St. Michael's sword, and interestingly, uh, the guide, uh, Peter Holcroft, told us uh, that this is exactly the place where the Michael NG current comes through the wall. So it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very unusual place. It's small. Uh, the, the, the width of the cave is only, I don't know, maybe 15 feet or something, 20 feet. Um, so it feels very different to any of the other node points. Uh, but Michael and Mary cross here uh, underground. And interestingly, um, when, when, when we visited, when we came out and uh, above, there's a skylight um, because that is the original shaft where people would come down. At top of that, there's actually uh, a manhole cover in the street uh, with, that lets air, uh, light in. And we went up and we looked at this. And as we looked at it, right next to it, I should have put a slide in, right next to it was a little plastic sword. Uh, <laughs> and my, so, Michael was saying, yep, yeah, I'm here, guys. <laughs> um, today, you actually come in, you don't have to scale down there, you come in a side passage. Uh, but actually, not that many people visit. And if you do go to England, uh, ch ch check out Royston Cave. It, it isn't open the whole time. Uh, you normally have to get permission. Uh, you phone up a local town council, and the guy will meet you there. It's that sort of thing. It may have become a little more popular since then. Um, but it's it's really interesting place. And then um, the penultimate node point, uh, Bury St. Edmund's Abbey uh, in, well, the town of Bury St. Edmund's. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, it's very, very uh, badly worn, uh, but here's a nice juxtaposition of um, the cathedral, I should have called it a city rule, of course, because uh, in England um, uh, uh, you can only call yourself a city if you have a cathedral, whereas here, any place where the certain population calls itself a city, uh, but in England you can only call yourself a city if you have a cathedral. And Bury St. Edmunds has this cathedral, and this tower is newly constructed. It was constructed for the millennium in the year 2000. It's the only new tower in a cathedral um, <coughs> to have been constructed for hundreds of years. Uh, and I think that's great because they never completed the job in the first place. And so Prince Charles was instrumental in that project to, to complete that. So I, I, I like the fact that here we have the old and the new, if you like, the dead uh, and, and the newly resurgent. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the lines do this. They, they move on. The lines, the lines are organic. Uh, and so uh, th life keeps moving in relation to them. And here we are. <laughs> right at the East Coast. Um, the Michael and Mary actually crossed just a little inland. Uh, there's an old church. Um, uh, and when you actually get to the ocean, Mary goes out here to the side of me, and Michael goes out here. Uh, 
So we were elated to be here after six weeks and having made this fantastic pilgrimage. Uh, uh, so we, we were saying thank you. Um, we were saying love and thanks. Uh, thank you, Michael and Mary, for being with us. Um, and, and we'll see you again. Uh, and uh, so it's really, really great experience to have spent that time, six weeks. Uh, and we, we, we w took a trailer with us and we slept at the sacred sites. Um, so we didn't stay in any sort of B&Bs along the way. We actually, for six weeks, were saturated in the energies of Michael. Uh, my familiar, and <laughs> I'm just looking at you. I think our faces show it, don't they? Uh, we're very, very happy. Um. The trailer was a caravan, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, what we really learned on the journey was, uh, and over the past years that we've been we've been going to these places and bringing people to visit is that energies come up to, to really impotentize um, the power of our intention. So what it is that we experience and what's important to us can be brought to life and to uh, be energized if you connect with it. And we think that that's what our ancestors knew and they knew how to to really utilize the energy of these places so that they could empower their ceremonies and what was important to them. Or even if it wasn't ceremonies, maybe it was potentizing uh, the growth of the seeds and uh, whatever it was, whatever it is that you dream, you can have become a reality. All you have to do is commit. And if you want to bring energy to your celebrations and ceremonies. There are lots of different ways of doing it. This is Stonehenge. And I think Tor had this, it was responsible for this group. No, it wasn't responsible, it just synchronically happened. Okay, yeah. well it's just amazing. And they're bringing what's important to them. It doesn't matter what your beliefs are. And you don't have to worry about what other people's beliefs are. But if you believe it, follow it with a passion, be in line with it, attune yourself to the earth, to nature, to all that's right in your world, and release what isn't. And here we are, down in Cornwall again, in a sacred sound. Yeah, you can do it anywhere. So. Here are the things that we think are worth remembering. The world is energy manifest. Pay attention to what you don't see, the balance of complementary opposites, the unique importance of water. Intention is the key. And when you put all of these into place, magic happens. Thank you.